Good morning. Welcome to Pride Christian Fellowship. We're here to worship Jesus today. I'm glad you made it. So today, we're going to start by standing. I guess we do that every Sunday in Czech tradition. Feel free to worship however is comfortable for you. Today we've got lots of room to move around. That's great. We've got Miranda leading worship. and I'll be bringing the message today. We're starting a new series called The Parables of Jesus. So let's go all the way through the fall. And Carolyn's going to open us up in prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit to fill the atmosphere here. And we just thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come and worship you in spirit and truth. Bring us into your spirit that we might be able to lift you up today and worship you in new ways to ourselves, just communing with you. Thank you for the presence of every person here. Fill us and help us to go away changed today. Walking deeper, walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see everybody's smiling faces. Um, we're going to join together in this time of worship. And the reason why we're here this morning is because God so loved the world. And that's why we're here this morning. And so we want to give him this time to just sing back to him and just give him our praise and our hearts because he's given us so much. So I'm just going to invite you guys to sing with us this morning about how God so loved the world.
just declaring your goodness. And this next song is, it's indescribable. It sings of how awesome God is, how he created the universe. And this morning, I just want us just to take a minute to recognize and realize how awesome our God is.
This next song we're going to sing. Uh, we're going to sing it in Czech. And if you don't uh, speak Czech or don't know these words, that's okay. Well, this this time of worship, we can just stay in it together. Uh, it's about bringing our heart. It's about our heart posture towards the King. This song talks about seeking God's face, and then we want to be close to Him every day.
Thank you, Miranda. Um, today, now it will be time of the offering, and this week I, I received something when I was reading the Bible and listening to some uh, preaching online, and I really wanted want to share with you because I, I hope it will also encourage you. Um, it's, I will read in Psalm 23, it's very well known, but I, I just love it. The Lord is my shepherd, I like nothing. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right path. For his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkness valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your roads and your staff, they comfort me. I think it's so good to just to think that we have a shepherd and, and today I, I want to ask you, okay, we all maybe believe in God, we believe God exists, but do we really believe that God is our shepherd? And does it mean that, do you really believe that God is going to provide for us? And, and for me it's not always easy, like sometimes I really have to wake up in the morning and, and commit again and say, okay God, I have to declare that you are, um, I, I just not only believe that you exist, but you are my shepherd. And I don't know if you know, but the sheep, they don't see very well. So if they don't have a shepherd, they don't really know where they go and they need guidance. And this is true in all the area of our life. We need guidance. We need guidance for um, for everything. But of course, now it's offering, so I'm more talking about the, the finances. And um, when we want to give, sometimes we are scared and we think, okay, like if I give this amount, do what I'm going to eat, how I'm going to pay for this and that, and we are scared. And when there is um, when there is fear, it means there is no trust in God. It means that we lack faith and we are not sure that God is our shepherd and God is going to provide. And in the Bible there are 7,000 promises. And at some point in your life, in every season in your life, you have some of these promises that are for you and they are really present for you at the moment. And I, I hope today this is, the, this is for you, that today God is going to provide in all the season, in all the area of your life, that if you're scared for your health, if you're scared that you won't get, you don't get any love, you don't get whatever you, you are scared to lack, God is going to provide if you are part of the flock. So just, you know, come in the flock and, and rest and, and be sure that like the song said, like all these promises are Amen, yes and Amen. So we, we have to stand for that and, and believe that. So when we, we are you know going to give something, just believe that you are not giving away something and you're not going to miss anything or lack anything because you give away. You're just participating to the, the kingdom and God is going to be there and to provide for you. So I really want to pray, God, that you will help us to believe your promises, to be part of them, and to believe that they are all true, because you are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. So give us a heart ready to give, not because we have to, but also because we are sure that you are here, and we don't have to fear anything. Yeah, amen.
are God, creator of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen in him, and through him all things are made. BibleProject.com and you can watch the whole thing, but I just wanted to show just the first 43 seconds if you can help me with that, Hofa. Jesus. 
Jesus of Nazareth was a master teacher, and some of his most well-known teachings are told in short stories called parables. Yeah, like the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who was looking for pearls, and when he found the ultimate pearl, he sold everything so that he could buy it. Must have been some pretty amazing pearl. Or the kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed that a farmer planted in his garden. It grew and became a huge tree, and birds came to perch in its branches. And that's a beautiful image, but what does it mean? Exactly. Jesus didn't tell parables to make everything clear. Rather, he wanted to provoke the imagination and invite people to see what God is doing in the world from a new perspective. So let's Perfect. Thank you. So just remember that, for, to see from a new perspective, that's what I want to talk about today. And Carolyn's going to read our scriptures. It's actually on two slides. This is the first of two. The parable of the Good Samaritan. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed the other side of the road and passed by him. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who atta was attacked by bandits, Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Luke 10, 29 to 37. Amen. Thank you. Now, what's the obvious themes of this parable? Compassion. What else? Certainly the topic of who is your neighbor. neighbor. That's right. Well, the answer is that it doesn't matter. Matter, matter whether you are a neighbor to the people around you. Okay. He says that the answer to that question doesn't really matter. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. Good. And I kind of wanted to talk about this parable from another way around. I'm sure you've heard a message on the neighbor. I'm sure you've heard messages on compassion. And I wanted to look at the story from the context of the story. And for me, the context of the story started back uh, when the legal expert asked Jesus a question. And what he wanted to do was he wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus, his intent here was not to give this guy a set of rules, a legalistic set of rules that he should follow. And that once he has these rules, he can turn around and judge other people so he feels good about himself. That was not Jesus' intent. Okay, that's what the legal expert wanted, but that's what Jesus was going to do. So, I look at this parable and I think uh, there's many people in this room, including myself, who have judged other people based on what we thought their compassion was. Was it good enough or not good enough? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. You know? And... <clears throat> 
I want to respond to that by saying that not everyone has a mercy gift. I'll say that again. We're all called to be merciful, but not everyone has a mercy gift. And if you have a mercy gift, um, people without that gift are not going to rise to the level that is just normal for you. It's kind of like if you're an evangelist. You know, not everyone is going to be as uh, willing to share their faith and freely do that as you do. And so we have this cycle sometimes in the church of judgment. Like I said, the evangelist wants to judge the mercy person because they're only giving, you know, food instead of eternal food. <laughs> or the, the pastor judges the evangelist because he wants to move down the road to the next group of people instead of staying planted where God planted him and serving the ones that God called him to. And the prophet judges the pastor for not doing only specifically what God, what God said to do and not all this other stuff in the flesh. And the mercy person judges the prophet who's so black and white and has so little compassion. And we can ask ourselves in the body of Christ, who is our neighbor? And so if you have a mercy gift, I would suspect that this is probably one of your favorite parables. Anybody relate to that? Yeah, I know there's some mercy people out here. And I want to share, just honestly, I do not have a mercy gift. <laughs> and I signed up for this. I picked this. And I do not have a mercy gift. In fact, I'll give you an example. Last month, we got rained out. We were supposed to be on the island, and we were in Starbucks. And I passed on this compassion opportunity. There was a, a non-Christian woman who came with her disabled son, and she wanted money. She wanted 1,700 crowns. And I had put baskets on the tables, but we didn't take a bath from that. We didn't, it was kind of a half a service, you know, we were rained out. And at the end of the service, all the baskets were empty, except for the one by the coffee box. And that had just a little bit of change in it. And I told the lady, I said, I'll give you what I have. And I gave her the change. And I know she was disappointed. But I also know if I gave her the 1,700 crowns, she would have been back the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and the next Sunday. And it wouldn't have fixed her problem. It might have even distracted her from working on something that would permanently fix her problem something sustainable. Now, in contrast to me is my wife who does have a mercy gift. And if she had been there that Sunday, I promise you, she would have taken care of that lady. She would have pulled out of her own pocket and made sure that lady walked away with whatever she was asking for. Okay? That's my wife. And I have to use the analogy, I call it the fish analogy. Kelsey wants to give a needy person a fish. Okay, I'm a pastor. I want to give them a fishing pole. Because if I give them a fish today, they're just going to be needy tomorrow, right? I want to give them something that can help them catch more fish, right? And the teacher, he wants to tell them how to catch fish, which is very important. And the prophet wants to tell them where to fish and when to fish, which is also very important. We tend to see situations and even parables uh, through the lens of our own gifting. And the question I have today is, do you judge others who have a different gifting than you do? Do you judge others who have different motivations than you do? Uh, the truth is, if you try to see uh, life's situations through other people's eyes, you will always learn something and you'll probably walk away with a lot more wisdom. Now, I'm not trying to say that my pastor's perspective is any better than my wife's mercy perspective. They are both valid. They're different, but they're both valid. And what I'm trying to say is that the hungry person was best served by the collective effort of the whole group. 
you know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of the body of Christ. We're, we're called to work together. And together, we can best serve the needs of others. Does that make sense? Now, let's finally get around to talking about the terrible parable. And <clears throat> not only am I not a mercy gifted person, but I'm also a left brain, not so emotional male. Okay, so this is probably going to look a little different than you'd expect, especially if you have a mercy gift. But I want to encourage you to try to see this um, from someone else's perspective. If you're a mercy person, uh, you're probably going to learn something seeing it from someone else's perspective. <laughs> okay, we'll start with some background. And the first part about the parable, it talks, us, talks about this trip from Jerusalem to Jericho. Um, this probably wasn't what you had in your mind, but they say a picture is worth a thousand words. It's actually, um, the trip is a change in elevation of like a thousand meters over 30 kilometers of this rugged terrain. And <clears throat> as you can imagine, without an animal to carry a wounded person, it's not going to be very easy to get someone in and out of here. Can you see that? I don't know if you noticed, but in the story, there's no mention of the priest or the Levi having a donkey or any other animal. And you know what? A desire to help without a means to help just leaves us feeling helpless. Right? Maybe that's what the priest and the Levite felt like. Maybe they felt helpless in this situation. You know, at times we're too quick to judge others without knowing their limitations. All right, let's talk about the first characters that come up, the robbers. Now, I'm guessing nobody in this room knows, knows this, and I read it, I assume it's correct. But what I read was that um, robbers in the Middle East at this time were known to beat their victims only, only if they resisted. So what that means is uh, this, this man that was wounded, um, he held on rightfully to what was his. Another way to say that is he uh, loved his possessions more than he loved his life. Right? something to think about. <clears throat> he consequently suffered a severe beating. Have you ever discovered it's easier to help a genuine victim than to help a person who is suffering from their stupid choices? That might have been crossing the mind of some of the people listening to this parable. <clears throat> and maybe the the original listeners here um, who understood some of these details, uh, maybe maybe they could identify more than you think with the priest and the Levi. You know, I think we all identify with the Good Samaritan. And I don't know that that was Jesus' original intent. But let's talk about the priest. It says a priest comes along. And a priest is a descendant of Aaron and was a high official in the Jewish religion, but he was also um, a high official in the Jewish government. Now, if you can imagine uh, today's situation, there is a Supreme Court judge, Czech judge, who is going from Prague to Burnham on important business, an important case or something. And he's driving along the D1, and he sees a car accident on the side of the road. And he's got to get to this courthouse. That's kind of what it, like, what it would have been like for a priest who's trying to get to where he's got to go for some very important business. 
And I probably should point out that nowhere in the story does it say the guy is rolling around the ground, um, moaning and crying. It doesn't say that at all. So we can assume the man was lying there unconscious and looked dead. And I don't know if you know this, but a, a priest is actually um, prevented by the law, like it's against his religion, it really is against his religion, to touch a dead body. Leviticus 21.1. And if he, if he were to go and touch a dead body, this Levi, he would have been in direct disobedience to God. So knowing that, I wonder, do you think Jesus was more concerned with the inflexibility of the priest than the law? Jesus, the new high priest, right? Not only did he compassionately reach out and touch the sick, he even touched the dead and raised the dead. Remember Darius' daughter? Yarius' daughter? Okay, let's talk about the Levi. He's not much better off than the priest. He not only had to go to the temple and do the services, he had to do all the grunt work that was associated with all those sacrifices. Like without him, things ground to a halt. And there was so much preparation to do to worship God. It, of course, everyone depended on the, on the Levi. But he was also bound by the law. If he were to find a dead body, he would have to immediately um, somehow dig a grave in that rock ground and bury the man. And then he would be unclean. And he would be unclean until his time was over. What do they call that? Uh, purification time was over. So, thinking about all this, I'm not sure if Jesus was talking only about compassion here. It might be that he was taking a jab at religion itself. Religion that created titles of importance like priest or Levi and self-importance. And religion that created busyness. And religion that created so many rules. By busyness, by rules. And of all things, he's a Samaritan. Just the kind of guy that the legal expert wanted excluded from the term neighbor. And Jesus makes a great point. Your best neighbor is not who you expect it to be. And the things that were important to the legal expert uh, were not so important in God's eyes. Things like rank, routine, religion, they don't seem to matter to Jesus so much. Now, <clears throat> You could say the Samaritan was not as important or not as busy, but the story tells us he was busy. He had somewhere to go, right? But his value of being compassionate helped him to come up with solutions on still to help, help the guy even though he was busy. He couldn't stay, but he could turn this guy over to an innkeeper and ask him to be cared for. And Samaritans were also religious people. Uh, but the man chose not to live his life under so many religious rules. He could probably touch a dead man, wash his hands, and move on with his business. He could decide in advance that he would choose people over rules. That he would, he would when, there, when there was a conflict, he would always choose compassion. And on the side of helping people. So, maybe to understand the parable, we have to rethink what we value. And I want to give you a left brain example of this. Unrelated example, but I think you'll get the point. Tithing begins with the choice of values. I value faithfulness to God over my selfish pursuits. It's planned and then it's implemented with consistency. I try to make it clear when I talk about tithing that tithing is not a spontaneous act. And if you show up and throw whatever's left in the basket, 
you will never be a tither. A tither, to be an effective tither, it begins with a budget. You have to see what comes in, what goes out, you have to plan, you have to make cuts sometimes, you have to um, control what you spend, you have to um, be able to say no, you have to create procedures like um, this is the first bill or I'll put this money away, it's in a safe place and it'll go. Um, it's a planned thing. And for someone like myself who is a non-mercy gifted person, um, to effectively be compassionate, uh, we need something similar. We need a plan. But it starts with the choice of values. Do I value my career? Do I value my personal productivity? And, <clears throat> or um, do I value kingdom opportunities? Like this one that Jesus brings up. You know, do you wake up asking yourself, um, what am I going to get done today? Or do you wake up asking God, how are you going to use me today? Are you living your life or living his life? And the second thing is, next, compassion needs a plan. So if you're too busy to pull over on the D1 highway, uh, work now on how to get less busy. So when that opportunity comes up, you'll be free to actually pull over. The Samaritan had uh, reserve funds. We, you know, we don't know where those funds came from, but for the sake of the story, let's assume that he saved up those funds intentionally in case there was a need, in case uh, there was an opportunity to show compassion for someone, that he would have resources available to help whoever God brought, God brought in his path. And, of course, the story tells us it's not safe bringing money on a road like that. You could get robbed and it would be all gone. But his value for being able to help people superseded his fear of what he might lose. So the point is that frequently compassion is simply a missed opportunity if we haven't planned for it. And it begins by challenging yourself about your values. Jesus said, yes, now go do the same. I don't know that do the same was do this, this thing. I think do the same is to have the same type of values that value people over rules, that value people over business, busyness, that value uh, people over, over your time and all these other things, that it begins with adjusting our values to reflect the kingdom of God. And so I wanted to take a minute and just uh, be quiet before the Lord, and I want you to ask the Lord uh, what needs to change in your values so that you might be prepared to be the Good Samaritan when the opportunity comes up. So can we take just a couple of minutes and go before the Lord? communion because one of the things about communion is it's a time of reflection and that's what I'm asking of you right now is to uh, not reflect what you're doing right or wrong it's not about it's about uh, what's in our heart and uh, communion is a time is if, if there's something that you want to change something that you want to give to God a communion is an opportunity uh, to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I want you to take this. I want you to take away this, this selfishness of mine or this busyness of mine or this self-importance of mine or, or this uh, religious thing that I've got on me. And I, Lord, I want you to set me free. And I believe there's power in coming to the Lord and, and asking 
uh, for freedom in this area so that you could be who God called you to be and you could be an effective a servant for the kingdom of God. So, I hope it's going to put some instructions on the board and we'll have wine over here. Is that what you got? Yeah. Wine over here and juice over here. And the, the trick is you have to let Linda or Carolyn spray your hands before you touch the plate because it's a common plate. And we don't drink from the cup anymore because of COVID. We just dip the, the bread into the cup. So Linda is going to pray. Can you do that? I love you. I love you all. I am so excited to be here. Um, when I was flying into Prague, I just heard one word resonating in my spirit, and it was freedom. 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 And as we come to this time, what freedom we have to celebrate our Lord's life and death and resurrection until He comes again. I am grateful for each one of you. So extremely grateful. You are like a little slice of heaven. So amazing. So, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come to us, Lord, body. As we remember Jesus, your sacrifice for us. We are grateful. We are yours. We are called by your name alone. Welcome. 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 Bring freedom to the people here and freedom to every man and woman and child in this nation. More of you and less of us. Thank you. Thank you. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm going to just wrap this message up. I'm, I studied finance and God blessed me with a giving gift. I didn't need any help um, becoming an effective tither. It was second nature for me. Um, but I do need help to be a compassionate person. I need to set up a plan and implement it so that it won't be a missed opportunity when it comes up for me. Now Kelsey, she's a mercy gift. She doesn't need any help. It just naturally comes easy for her. But she does need the help setting up a budget, making a plan to be an effective tither. You know, we're all different. We all have our areas that are easy and our areas that are struggle. But what's important is that we appreciate each other's differences rather than judge one another over those differences. It's okay that we're different. God uses it all. And regardless of our giftings, you know, we find ourselves at different stages and different places in life. Paul says it's better not to marry so that you would not be encumbered uh, by these, quote, earthly responsibilities and you'd be more effective for the kingdom of God. And then he turns around and says it's not a sin to marry. Go ahead. Some of us are married and our first ministry is to our spouse. Uh, some of us are called to be uh, providers for big families right now. Some of us are students and we're uh, preparing to be providers and to be givers. And some of us are blessed with lots of small children. And the only, the only person that's going to get the Good Samaritan treatment is going to be those little kids for a long time because they're consuming. The important part 
is that recognize that God's called you to this place and it's not forever. It's just a season. And sometimes who God has called us to be is in conflict with what God has called us to do. And whenever I come into that conflict, I for one want to be faithful to who call God called me to be first. Be who God called you to be. You don't have to change yourself or excuse yourself because you don't look like everyone else. If God has uh, put you in a time and a season where you've got a bunch of small kids, uh, embrace it, enjoy it, and recognize you cannot save the world. You do what you can. Be who God called you to be and be at peace. And you might be in a season with a lot of earthly responsibilities, but you know what? These seasons come and go. Maybe today we're not the Good Samaritan, um, but you know, we're always the child of the King. We can't save everyone. <clears throat> we can't always pull over and help every time. We don't always have a donkey when we need one. Sometimes we feel helpless. There's nothing we can do but pray. Sometimes we're the priest or the Levi. And in those times, often the person that we judge the most is ourselves. We're not always called to be the hero. We're always called to be part of the solution. Even if it's just to pray is part of the solution. Maybe for the sake of our story, we could say the back story of the parable was that the priest passed by and went and hired the Samaritan to bring the donkey and help the man. And the Levi was there and he gave him some extra money to pay the innkeeper. And the Levi and the priest went back to the temple and prayed for this man's healing and restoration. If that was the story, the truth is that this wounded man would have been best served by the collective effort. Who? Who is your neighbor? We are. Each of us are part of that mosaic. And all together, we look and we act like Jesus Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are His hands and His feet. And we all have a role to play. Even though your role might look different from my role, your role is as important as any role. Be who God called you to be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this story, how it relates to each and every one of us. And I pray, Lord, that, that you would equip us to be the compassionate people that you called us to be. That you would equip us to be the good neighbor that you have called us to be. And Lord, that you would equip us uh, to walk in unity and not in division or judgment. Lord, help us to appreciate one another's differences and help us to uh, take our place in the body of Christ and give through our gifts and our motivations. And help us, Lord, to accept where we are, even when we can't always be the hero. Help us to be at peace with doing our part. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand. And Cindy's going to come down here and give you an opportunity for ministry and say benediction. Thank you, Pastor. Great word. How many of you have felt corrected? You don't have to raise your hands, but this wonderful correction in our thinking and our judgments. We all judge. There's not one here that doesn't judge, not one of us, based on who we are and our worldview. So, 
First of all, I would like to invite and the prayer teams to come up. And if there's anybody that would like to be prayed for after the service, we will have people standing here. Um, Linda, you can come up and join Carolyn if you like. And um, and we will uh, do prayer, have prayer teams here to pray. So I'm going to close the service and say, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, that you have come to serve others, to not rule in power or in wealth or position or to be seen or heard, Lord. But Father God, nobody probably recognized the Good Samaritan. He did it all on his own with no reward. He humbled himself and saw the hurting and God raised him up and put him in the word of life for us to read for generations and generations till eternity on. It will never be forgotten of what this good Samaritan did. And he never saw it for himself. He did what was needed to do. Help us, Father. Help us. Create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us, Lord. And help us to learn the body of Christ has different gifts. For us to study that out and to be prepared to say to somebody else, come along and help me. I don't see as you do and I need the eyes which Jesus has given you. Be a family. Come together. Join together. I bless you all with the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word, the truth to know what the different your people around you and your sphere of influence, their gifts are, their talents. And that we don't judge them, but we say, wow, I'm so grateful for you. Come and help me be whole. Because we need each other, family, in these days. We need each other. So I bless you with wisdom and knowledge and understanding to go forth and to be a good Samaritan in your sphere, in your influence, and to give, give, give your time, your love, a handshake, a prayer, your finances, and everything that you have. In the name of Jesus, go forth, celebrate life today, and be encouraged by this word you heard today, in Jesus' name.